microphone, whatever you need to speak there, they're on you. Okay, awesome. Welcome, thank you so much for coming. Uh, this excites me because it's a joint uh, event between women lead out of the law school, women in philanthropy, Melissa, who is the primary organizer, she's amazing, uh, and Anderson Women out of UCLA Anderson School of Management. And we have guests here from who are friends of friends, and that just makes our get together so much richer. So thank you all for coming. Our topic tonight, our panel tonight, is stories of success, lessons learned launching a startup. And this will be an informative discussion with a Hello, hello. Yeah. Accomplished UCLA alumna and advisors who've been involved in launching startup businesses. Uh, I am uh, have a group at Merrill Lynch in Santa Monica. I am president of Anderson Women uh, out of the business school. And I'm a board member of Women in Philanthropy, newly on the membership committee. So look out. We want you. <laughs> Uh, women in Philanthropy, oh, and I, I want to mention also our illustrious profes Professor Jeff Scheinrock, who's joining us from Anderson. Very illustrious. <laughs> Very illustrious <laughs> and demanding. My, my professor, <laughs> one of my favorites because he's no, no nonsense, very practical, and I can pretty much sum up the semester in a, in a few words, which is, yeah, but Who's going to pay for it? <laughs> <laughs> if you don't have customers, you don't have a business. Right? Right. Uh, so let me tell you a bit about women in philanthropy because they're really bringing us together here. Uh, women in, ph in philanthropy at UCLA celebrates and inspires women's giving across the UCLA campus and fosters women's participation on campus boards and volunteer leadership positions. This group celebrated its 20th anniversary two years ago, and since 1994, the members have donated close to 577 million. So that's over half billion. <laughs> it's really remarkable, and even more remarkable are the women who you will meet who are members, and particularly some of the founding board members who are here tonight really very, very special women. Um, we touch nearly every corner of the campus and one of the real benefits of being a member is events like this that meet all over campus and we get to learn and see what's going on everywhere. A lot of great thinkers. We heard from a wonderful astronaut last week who was a double Bruin. <laughs> uh, many, many roles in every corner you can imagine. About tonight's program, only 4.2% of Fortune 500 CEO positions are held by women. In the corporate sector in particular, despite steady movement toward gender equality and improved pay conditions, women still earn only 81% of their male counterparts. Salaries today are taking a huge step toward equality and the empowerment of female employees. They're fostering cultures that pull down the old paradigms and create a less restricted space for people to develop their skills. Startup culture is one that is generally more flexible, open, and accepting of irregular hours and work locations. This is the sort of supportive working environment that's hard to come by in long-established corporations. It's been predicted that women-owned businesses are set to increase by 90% in the next five years, and it's where we see women flowing in. Anderson is number one in entrepreneurship in the country. Uh, we have a tremendous law school with, I believe, over 50% women enrollment enrolled. We have, um, we're gonna hear from a woman attorney who works in the field helping, helping others set up startups. And we have some, some wonderful women entrepreneurs who have customers. <laughs> 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 
There's a great deal of expertise and experience among UCLA graduates, consultants, and professors on launching new entrepreneurial entities. Uh, you will hear from experts who will review, reveal ideas, insights, and lessons learned from their experience advising or creating startup enterprises. We would like to thank Manat Digital Media for providing the refreshments for our event this evening. Manat. Manat. Get it right, Kim. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> it's like, who dat Manat? After, I apologize. <laughs> After the program, you will have an opportunity to network with one another as business professionals and philanthropists. Professor Jeff Scheinrock is UCLA, UCLA Anderson Faculty Director, Applied Management Research Program. What that means is we have some courses that are theory and some courses that are practical. Uh, about half of our coursework is graded in groups and about half of our coursework is graded individually and about 100% of Professor Scheinrock's is graded in groups, so teamwork uh, it's the closest to real world, I think, that you can get uh, when you're in class. He has been a continuing lecturer for 10 years and director of the Business Creation Option Program at the UCLA Anderson Graduate School of Management. In addition, Jeff is currently the president and CFO at Originate a pioneer in venture resources which invests capital and elite engineering talent and startup expertise into high potential opportunities. Jeff has advised many startup entities, some of which I know, including many created by students. It's all oh, yours. Thank you. So I'm Jeff. Uh, <laughs> I'm Jeff. The, uh, this is informal. I'm honored to be here with the, the panel. I have to tell you uh, the topic, it's interesting. So Originate has offices across the country, my, my company, and we, I'm proud to say that we, uh, starting yesterday, was our most senior female employee who was in charge of our largest office, who was hired as a managing director of our New York office. And we just brought on our first female board member who was COO of AOL Time Warner. So yeah, so, uh, and I can tell you, I think the last six hires that we've had have all been women. So there are more women uh, in my classes at UCLA. Each, each quarter it increases. Uh, there's business creation option. I would say that uh, more and more uh, leaders of the, of the uh, teams are women. And, uh, and I do believe women over the years got a raw deal. Uh, and that, I think that's changing quickly. Um, I have several of my students or past students who are here and uh, one's, on the, one's on the panel. And, um, uh, so I'm happy to have Carolyn. Carolyn uh, uh, is a very successful, has a great company called, I have to read these things because I'm old, um, <laughs> uh, uh, Hop, Skip and Drive. So it's, uh, I'll let her uh, explain a little bit what, when we go through this, but it's uh, if you need help with uh, driving, picking up, uh, delivering your children with a, you know, a uh, safe, uh, vetted driver, call Carolyn, 1-800- no, I'm um, <laughs> Hopskipdrive.com. Yes. <laughs> uh, Sarah is uh, somebody I work with. Uh, it's Sarah Ferguson Shambliss. Uh, she is one of the attorneys we use. She's with Manat. That's how I know it's called Manat. Uh, Manat Phelps, they also paid for the food, so thank you. Um, Sarah is one of the top startup attorneys uh, working with young companies and growing companies here in Southern California and also one of the attorneys that uh, we utilize in our company. Eunice is one of my past students who I'm very proud of. Uh, she will, uh, she just, can I talk about it? She just got a, a huge deal with Bloomingdale's and, uh, and is, uh, it, uh, she will be, uh, so her, uh, her clothing company is uh, expanding quickly and we're very proud of her at uh, UCLA Anderson. Uh, Rosie uh, O'Neill is co-founder of Sugar Fina, which is a very uh, successful company, uh, which I'm sure you've heard of. And Elise is um, Killing, is founder, director of City Fellows Consortium and Women in Venture and a venture partner at Veneta Project. So we have a short time here uh, uh, and I want to try to use it wisely. So we have people who advise, I would assume that's uh, 
uh, Vanetta and uh, Sarah uh, work with younger companies, I guess investing companies, uh, and work with them to give them advice. Uh, and I'm curious from the two of you, of, of all the companies that you have seen, um, what, what advice do you give that the entrepreneurs don't listen to? <laughs> <laughs> that's a really good question. Um, sometimes I feel like all of my advice gets ignored. Um, but that's, <laughs> you know, um, the, I, I think probably the number one fear in terms of startups when they talk to their attorney is my attorney is going to give me advice that's going to result in me having to spend a lot of money that I don't have. And so the advice that most often gets ignored is the advice that I give that would lead to them making an investment to avoid things in the future which have not happened yet. Um, and things that are on the horizon that maybe are not very real to them. And so to give you a concrete example, um, securing your intellectual property within your company through intellectual property assignments and then taking active steps to protect that intellectual property, whether it's through filing trademarks or um, prosecuting patents, which trademarks can be expensive depending on your mark and how crowded the space is. Patents are always expensive. Mm -hmm. But if your intellectual property is core to your business proposition, it is extremely important that you be able to explain to potential investors why they should be investing in you and not the company down the street that could do exactly what you're doing. And one of the ways that you do that is by protecting your most valuable asset. And so I think that's where I do see companies cutting corners you know, where maybe they shouldn't. Okay, and Elise, and I'm not familiar with the Netta project, so sure, maybe so what is that? And Sure, I'll, I'll give a, a quick bit of background. So I'm coming from two of, I've been a VC three times, so at three different firms, um, two of the larger funds here in LA and have worked with probably hundreds of founders, but in the past year, so 2015, um, worked on over 500 deals and did 22 investments. So now, um, at the end of the year, I left to start my own practice, um, but continue to advise Veneta Project, which is a network for women founders, and continue to work with women in venture, and also advise um, other investors, actually, um, on how to invest in new emerging technologies, which is something I did, um, and, you know, the... Um, the sophistication of investors can really have an impact in how these emerging technologies advance. And so <coughs> I'm spending time there this year. Um, you know, when I give advice to founders, I generally just give it and leave it and don't always follow up to see what's you know followed or what's not. And I think that it's quite important. I take the Buddhist approach to say, you know, if this resonates with you, then you hold on to it and you go forward with it, and if it doesn't, you let it go. And um, I generally don't care if people, you know, go along the path that I'm suggesting. But what I do see, I think, people getting turned around on sometimes is knowing their own value and pushing back against mm -hmm. um, other against VCs. So whether that mean reaching out multiple times or even reaching out cold or um, e turning down an offer of something um, to optimize for the, their position in the longer term. Sometimes it seems like that's a bit harder to do. Okay, very good. Mm -hmm. Carolyn, uh, did you have a mentor? And if so, how did you utilize the mentor? Um, that's a really good question. I actually, I'm gonna give you the answer you probably don't want, which is I didn't have a mentor. Um, okay, we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I was coming uh, from many years of practicing law, and following that, um, was running a nonprofit, and entered this world uh, alone in many ways. I had a friend who had gone to business school, University of Michigan, and I was leaning on her a lot. She uh, she offered to meet with me for half an hour every Monday at her office, and gave me homework every week, and uh, we did that for about six months. And uh, I wouldn't call her a mentor per se because she wasn't a VC, she wasn't a startup founder herself, but she would advise me um, through the process and incidentally introduced me to a woman who became a VC who introduced me to my co-founders 
who is now at our one of our lead investors. So it all sort of worked out. Came full circle. Yeah. Very good. And Eunice, did you have someone advising you when you went on your journey? I would say um, my dad was my mentor just because he was um, in an industry that was pretty related to me. So my family business is in textiles. Uh, they're based in Los Angeles and they started by manufacturing and distributing fibers and then manufacturing textiles. So even though it's not really apparel and it's not retail, I had a lot of, um, it was a in related industry and I had always looked up to him as a businessman. So he was sort of my mentor in the beginning and I had a lot of um, friends, a network of friends who was in this retail industry who really sort of became my uh, support and my emotional crutch. And then I, I think I came across you know, a more mentor-esque mentor more recently. And that was actually through um, my company. So she was a customer who was just so involved with our company and the brand that she is the one who introduced us to Bloomingdale's and sort of you know, helped us make that first deal, which is now helping us make more deals with them and sort of growing the company. So I found her sort of very organically that way. Good. And Rosie, did, did somebody help you out? And yeah, not so much on the entrepreneurship side. I was in the corporate world before I left to start my own company, and I had a couple of really great, strong, inspirational women there. And one of them actually probably gave me the best advice ever, which was, "What are you still doing here? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, you're you don't strike me as someone who is meant to climb the corporate ladder and and work in a gray box your whole life." Um, you know, essentially get out of here. So that was a, a good piece of advice that she gave me. So when I'm going to go back to the, the, the three operating companies. Um, when you went out to raise, have all of you raised funds? Yes. Eunice has not. So let me go to, let me stay with Rosie for a minute. Do you think being a woman, did it hamper your fundraising? Uh, no, it, I think it helps. Uh, and seriously. why do you say that? Well, you know, um, like it or not, women are a minority in entrepreneurship. And I actually think that's a huge competitive advantage because, one, you have a really different point of view. Women make most buying decisions. So have, especially when you have a consumer product like we do, having someone in the room who not only knows the customer but is the customer really goes a long way. We have a more female-oriented product, and so I think the fact that I am a woman like just gives credibility. I, I know my customer, I know what she wants, I'm gonna take this business to the next level. And you know, being a woman, you stand out. These, uh, you know, these investors and these um, institutional firms, you're talking to men all day long, it's kind of a breath of fresh air to have a different perspective. And so I would say always look at it as an advantage. And if you go in with that level of confidence, um, you'll have a, a, a great result from that. And you, Carolyn? Uh, I tend to disagree, maybe industry related. Um, we're in the technology space, so we're really, we are, they call us Uber for kids, so we are dealing with people who are dealing with technology companies all day long. And I think there is an inherent bias against women. Um, it's very indirect. People would ask us questions like, do you have an office? And we'd say, like, are you working from home? You know, because they knew we were mothers, because we're three mothers with eight children, and we talk about that a lot. That's a big part of our brand. And uh, we're like, yes, we have an office. We're running a company. And I, I, I wonder if anyone would ever ask a man if he had an office. Mm -hmm. uh, I also think that we were pushing up against this, like, mompreneur stereotype, which is like this sort of Etsy, working from home, like this is a side project, something really fun to do. Um, other than that, I don't think there were any biases. In fact, our investors really believe in us, right? whether you, we were women or not. You have some of the top investors here in Los Angeles, so, I mean, because you shared with me. Sure. Um, and so I think the, what, what I can take away from that is if you have a solid business idea, if you have a, a, a strong team, Yes. There is money available and you can raise. Absolutely, you can raise. I mean, we came also with, with pedigrees. I mean, I went to law school here. One of my co-founders went to Wharton. The other co-founders from Stanford Business School. I mean, we came with, with, a, with resumes that was, were difficult to argue with and backgrounds. 
uh, I think as a first time founder, if someone shows up without that and a, just a really good idea, uh, you know, I, I think it would be more challenging. So, Eunice, you're fortunate. You haven't raised outside capital at this point, and if you can avoid it, I think that's great. But you're dealing in, in, a, in an industry. Uh, do you find, being a woman, you're hampered in dealing with suppliers and dealing with uh, the business issues you face every day, or do you um, think it doesn't matter? It's not so much that I'm a woman, but that I'm young. So retail and apparel and manufacturing, they're all very traditional, you know, mature industries. And apparel is also largely very much controlled by very old men right. <laughs> in the management positions. So I think that um, my age was, uh, put me at a disadvantage, especially in like negotiating situations as a newcomer coming in. And you know, when I first started, I didn't have this you know, I, I had the schools, but I didn't have this professional experience that would show that I would be successful, you know, launching my own company, mm -hmm. my clothing company. So that was, that was difficult. And, and uh, Elise, um, if I heard you correctly, when you went over your background, you worked at other venture funds before your current mm -hmm. situation where it's focused on women in business. At no, the other firms, not, was it? It's not focused. So my what I'm working on now is focused on blockchain and machine learning or deep learning technology. Okay. But I have um, I, I advise a group that's focused on ah, women okay, founders. Okay, so but at the at the current firm and the prior firm that you were at, did did what? Uh, the tough question, I guess. Uh, your partners, the people you dealt with every day, I, you know, I assume, was it harder? Was it, did you treat the women entrepreneurs any different than you did the men and the teams that came in? I'm just, uh, that's a loaded question. I don't want <laughs> yeah, to get so sued, maybe but. I'll, I mean, yeah, uh, maybe I'll um, answer broadly. So I don't know how many people in the audience are coming from the tech world, but I wouldn't want to, I think you definitely can access capital. It's definitely harder. It's just by orders of magnitude. So, um, you know, there, it's like 7% of VC money goes towards women and actually women produce better returns and the numbers should be flat, right? So women should have the same returns as men do if they were being evaluated equally. So I think, and it's not just women, but it's folks that aren't, you know, it's like black guys or Latin and Hispanic founders, and certainly some, uh, you know, some Asian founders too. It's much harder. So, um, I think it's harder at every stage. So, uh, what I saw, I, I've worked with seed stage or even pre-seed stage companies, and I've done pre-IPO deals. So, what you see is that at the seed stage, there'll be, you know, it'll be like 50-50 men and women, and then at every progressive stage, it'll be much less. So, by the time you get to like Series B, it'll be you know, mostly zero. Like I rarely saw Series B stage companies, but that's not not the ones that were funded, yeah. right? Because it's just harder to get funding. So if you can get funding at seed and A, then you're definitely going to get the B done and all of that. So you know, I'm sure that it's a much higher rate, um, but it's harder. You know, doesn't mean that you can't do it, um, but the bar is different. Okay. And Sarah, I know that you're very active with all the different venture funds and represent lots of companies looking for funding and I'm curious, do you see any difference uh, between the different funds and uh, when you're representing a company run by a woman versus a man that's in a similar situation with you know revenue run rates and stuff? I mean, what do you see and how do you handle that? Yeah, I, I do and I'm, it's, it's a shame to have to say that because I think that when I, when I work with investors, when I talk to investors, there is a desire to change the statistics and to change the behavior. I think um, there's a lot of folks in the investment community that will speak to that as a goal and a, an aim, and in particularly when you're talking at the accelerator level and the funds that fund companies that come out of accelerators, we hear a lot of conversation around diversity. However, <laughs> I see the term sheets. I see a lot of term sheets. And the t I, I hate to say it, the term sheets that are presented to women, in my own experience, this is purely anecdotal, they are not as good. And I tell women to press back. 
you know, because I have, I get a lot of You all insight. understand the term sheet and what... So, <laughs> and I, I really hate to put it that way, um, because like I said, I think there is a desire for change. And unfortunately, I also, I like to call myself like corporate psychologist. <laughs> I just, I hear a lot of the stories. I do work with a lot of women founders. I'm very proud to work with a lot of women founders, a lot of really creative, really driven women with grit and determination who are incredibly smart and they cry on my couch about what so-and-so investor said at a happy hour after to her in the presence of other people after he had had three cocktails. And so I do think that there is a lot of room for change. Um, and I, but I think, you know, I don't necessarily know what the answer is to all of that, but the short answer to your question is yes. <laughs> Yeah, earlier in my career, I was in an aerospace company, and I had a young lady named Marion Jo, and she uh, was of Korean descent. Uh, she looked like she was 12. She wasn't. I mean, she looked younger than what she really was. It was a male-dominated industry, and people d just treated her with tremendous disrespect. And I'm happy to say that she won Entrepreneur of the Year of Se in Seattle. Mm. She won the best, uh, the best entrepreneur in Seattle under the age of 40. And uh, you know she overcame this. I, uh, you know aerospace and defense at the time was a very ma male dominated, probably still is a very do male dominated industry. So I'm going to switch here. Uh, I'm asking these questions because it's sort of like a woman conference. So let's talk about men. No, I'm sorry. Uh, no, uh, so um, I'm curious from our three operating um, companies. Not that you know the VC and the uh, attorney isn't, aren't operating. Um, did you come up, to, what's like, if you're willing to share it, uh, uh, something that didn't go right and what did you learn from it in your business? How did you handle it? Sure. Um, hiring the right people is critical. Uh, definitely made a couple of bad hires in the beginning and, you know, it's, it's interesting not just from a, not just from a skill perspective but also from a cultural fit. Like if you have someone who isn't uh, doesn't think and have the same vision as you know the rest of the people in the company and you know even uh, you know potentially is kind of a downer <laughs> and brings people down it can spread through a small company very fast and so I think uh, I think it's really really critical to have a sharp eye on not just this the background of the people that you hire but also just how they fit in your company um, and to be diligent about weeding out the people who aren't working out um, because the longer you let them stay, the, the harder it is to get to that next stage. Well, most people don't like confrontation mm -hmm. and they don't like firing people. Mm -hmm. So they let them stay longer. Yeah. And you know, I've learned in my career, I'm a lot older than all of you combined. <laughs> um, I've learned in all the companies that I've worked with that um, when someone's not performing, they actually know it. Mm -hmm. And so, and the people that work in the company alongside that person who's not performing, they know it. And um, <laughs> they're all expecting it to happen, and you're just afraid to do it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's very hard to fire somebody, so most people let it linger longer. Mm -hmm. and, Especially and in California. You, well, yeah, yeah well, the the, we can get into oh, yeah. the laws about <laughs> yeah, how hard it is. But uh, no, I think your point is a, is a good one and one that most people face. They, um, you know, uh, you should hire slow and fire fast mm -hmm. when someone's not working. Yeah, stole my line. Uh, so, sorry, <laughs> I teach this stuff. Um, uh, so, um, uh, what about you? What well, other than funny. hiring? Is there another well, I was firing? Gonna, I was going to dovetail on um, rapid growth. Yep. Um, rapid growth is something that everybody's looking for. We, we like to talk about thoughtful growth. Thoughtful growth because we're dealing with very precious cargo. We're literally putting small children in cars with people that, with drivers that they've never met before. And um, we're very conscious of that. So we are not Uber. We're not onboarding drivers 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Um, that being said, we have very high um, ambitious goals and we are growing very quickly. So there are um, periods of time where we were hiring very quickly. I think I, in the last two weeks I've hired 15 people and um, so how are you managing the quality of so, that? So part of what's tough about that is the last time we went through that rapid hiring phase, um, I wear a lot of hats. I'm general counsel to the company. I'm our lawyer. 
I'm the head of people and HR and policy. You don't have to keep apologizing right. that you're a lawyer. So I'm proud of the fact that I'm a lawyer. I think there are not enough lawyers in startups. So, um, so that being said, you know, I was maybe the first round of rapid hiring focused on other things. And someone would say, oh, do you want to meet this person? I'd say, oh, if she's OK with you, she's, I'm sure she's fine. And you know, six months later, I'm hiring an employment lawyer mm -hmm. because I think she's going to sue us. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, would, I would really focus on culture fit. And um, I think the biggest mistake we made during that rapid hiring phase was you know, now I have a policy that we do not hire a single person. I don't care if you're a customer support rep working eight hours a week. Like you need to sit in a room with me, and if I'm not available, they need to come back. Um, mm -hmm. So that's the lesson that I learned. And you think you can keep doing that till what size or forever? Well, I am currently a team of one, um, but as my team grows, then I will have <laughs> clones of myself <laughs> who will be able to do what I do. Eunice, and what kind of? Do you have, it, of course, you didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> no, every day. <laughs> Um, I think my um, big thing that was very disappointing and didn't work out for me was uh, finding a co-founder. So this is something that we talked about a yep. lot in your EDI class is that you know people want, especially investors, they want to see that you have a team and you have co-founders, someone that uh, can really work with you and complement you and your skill sets. But I didn't have that when I was starting my business. I sort of kind of started this on my own, um, started kind of testing it while I was in school and launched it right after school. So I started it alone, but I had this huge chip on my shoulder about the fact that I didn't have a co-founder. And I wasn't really sure if I needed one, but I thought that I needed one. So I, I um, was always on the lookout for one. Um, and that picture of my ideal co-founder was always shifting. But um, about, I, I think, maybe two years ago, I, I thought I had found the person. So we like, went through this whole process and you know, talked about like, whether we were really going to be co-founders. And you know, I, I actually called you up. We had a phone conversation about this because I, you know, of course, I gave you the right to, uh, information. <laughs> you did. <laughs> okay. you, you confirmed my, my, my gut you know, um, instincts and my, my uh, what is it, doubts about the, the partnership. Right. But ultimately, it didn't work out. She wanted something that I couldn't give her, and I thought it was a little bit unfair based on the fact that I had already, you know, I already had a revenue generating company and the product. and. So it didn't work out, but it was hugely disappointing to me. But my learning experience was that finding a co-founder, just like raising money, is very, very time consuming. So, um, and also, you know, if that person doesn't work out, I don't think it necessarily means that, if you don't have a co-founder, I don't think that necessarily means that you're set up for failure, because I also, you know, um, I, I think that it really has more to do with like whether or not you have the, the team around you and the support around you that uh, spurs you on in the moments of like difficulty so that you as a lone uh, founder doesn't get overwhelmed and you know just gives up. Um, so yeah. It's it lonely when you're alone. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's hard when you can't share with other yeah. people. I mm -hmm. mean it's yeah. uh, <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine. Yeah. We do a lot of crying, the three yeah. of us, no, you know, together so, for two years. So, you know. so, 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 so I'm just curious, Sarah. Not at work. A lot of people <laughs> come to you for advice. A lot of these young companies. Uh, what are the are there common? What are the biggest issues you see that they bring to you? Mm. I mean, what do they need help with the most? Um. So I I know one doesn't one size doesn't fit all. But. Yeah, no. I I think that there is a trend now with startups in terms of um, you know there's a, there's a lean methodology which uh, essentially requires you to do all of your legal yourself until a fairly late stage in the process. Um, and um, and there is a you know a, a really kind of widespread attitude about legal services being. Um, non-essential or too expensive. Mm -hmm. And I always <laughs> tell people that um, you are going to spend more money to hire a competent attorney who knows this space. Because knowing how startups work and how investors think 
is a huge advantage. Um, and so just hiring any old sol solo practitioner out there who knows how to file a form with Delaware is not going to get you where you need to be to take an investment. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to spend a little more to hire that professional. Um, but when you delay the process, um, there's, there's an inverse correlation, um, or I should say there's a direct correlation between how much you will spend and how long you delay engaging with competent legal counsel. So the longer you delay um, hiring someone to audit your books and records that you've been keeping yourself, the more you're gonna pay for corporate cleanup on the back end when it counts. When your company is worth a significant amount of money and facing an M&A exit opportunity and the investment bankers ask you to assemble a deal room and you realize that you've been doing your entire business on a purchase order basi basis and you have never documented a board meeting and um, it's almost too late at that point. <laughs> I mean, we can do some of the work to clean that up, but not all of it. And so... Um, Attorneys don't like when you backdate documents. <laughs> as, yes, as Jeff and I, we've explored that concept together yeah. um, <laughs> with, uh, with portfolio companies. So, um, so I guess, you know, the most common trend that I see is to delay, 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 and then you are facing a significant event like a, like a significant investment and suddenly you are running a fire drill with, you finally hire that competent attorney, you're running a fire drill and you're going to spend five to 10 X what you would have spent if you had just done it right on the front end. And honestly, I don't judge that. Like, <laughs> I don't, it's not my job to judge to do that, that, um, uh, risk analysis for the founder. Sometimes you have $5,000 in the bank account and you have to pay the developer because you need a product. And having perfect legal documents with no product doesn't get anybody anywhere. And I totally understand that. Um, but just understand what the trade-off is, right? The, right. The, there's a very direct trade-off. You will definitely spend more later. So um, luckily there are firms that have deferred fee arrangements and different ways of working with startups that are in that position. But that's You can negotiate fees and structures with your attorneys, but don't tell Sarah I said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Elise, and the companies that you've invested in once you do your due diligence on the earlier side, let's say, uh, on the, you said you were involved with early mm -hmm. stage and later stage, do you, what are the, are there common or what are you know, some of the significant issues you face with the teams that come to you because you've given them money or mm -hmm. the firms that you know given them money? What do, you, what do you see are the challenges companies, early stage companies face? In raising? Oh, no, after you've raised oh, the, after. after you've invested. Wow, you're working it's so with different. It depends on the, I mean, it, I guess it depends on the sector. Um, I liked everything that you had to say that was, I was thinking, like, I don't really see that stuff, mm -hmm. you know, and I was yeah. thinking, I wonder who that means was, like, really having to scramble to get it done. Mm -hmm. um, I guess I, if I'm just going to follow from what you started, I see sometimes folks not having their uh, financials together in a way that can be diligenced mm -hmm. and... I also think most people are not doing diligence, actually. I would be curious what the founder's experience up here is, but I always do diligence, so we, are, like, we really know a company. I really know a company before I invest or before any of my teams have, but because other folks aren't doing it, they'll get to me or to us, and there'll be you know, like some PDF of their financial projections, <laughs> and I'm, that's not gonna work, because you know, I don't actually know what you're thinking by looking at a PDF. So I suppose along the line of preparing legally, um, if you're going to work with someone that's gonna really know your business, which I think always accelerates your growth, also helps you accelerate raising that round because other investors can use their work to get to know you in future rounds, it's good to, um, to come in with solid financials or show your work and your financials so that we can have a conversation about what you're expecting and doing. Very good. So one of the things that I teach and then, you know, I, I'm a, my company is a little company. We probably see 100 deals a month, and nobody knows who we are. So we have offices in San Francisco. I mentioned New York, Las Vegas, and here in L.A. And one of the things I tell the students, because I teach in the entrepreneurship, is, you know, one of the, when you're an entrepreneur, you're, you know, you're, you're very engaged. You, 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 you know, very excited about what you're doing. But 
and you, and you can talk a good game. But what's really important to you if you want to make money and also to if you want to raise money to investors is getting, a per, getting a, that first customer, mm -hmm. getting a purchase order. Somebody who is willing to pay for your product and service that shows there's a demand. And I'm curious for the three of you, how did you handle that first customer order? I mean, did you have to do unnatural acts or, uh, I mean, because you're, you're young, you're, most young companies, you're, you're displacing somebody who is there or you're, you need to convince the buyer or the person who's going to actually give you money um, to, to bet, bet on you. So how did you convince, what did you do? How did you handle that? Uh, we gave it away. Okay, so your first customers free, were free. Literally, okay. um, from November. Free is good. From November 2014 to March of 2015, we had a 100% free pilot um, where we did rides for free. And um, we put our own kids in those cars. We tell our customers that we put our own kids in those cars. That was always very valuable to get over the trust and safety hump. Um, but giving away for free is interesting in our business because we're not giving away you know, like pants, which would be awesome if someone gave me free pants. If someone tries to give you a free babysitter, you assume that there's something must be wrong with, with that, that babysitter. babysitter. <laughs> right? like, so it's like, who wants like the bargain basement nanny? You want like the high class nanny who's charging more because you think she's better. Um, so we actually saw a very interesting inverse reaction where we had customers who wouldn't use us until we started charging them. Mm -hmm. uh, which was great. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but we, we started, we really got that initial traction uh, with a free service, free pilot, uh, and as they, they just started rolling in, you know, we were filling. Once they used you, they had to have you. Absolutely, I mean, customers regularly, still to this day, although I hate this analogy, um, call us crack. Because they say like, <laughs> once we use you, we cannot go back because we didn't have a solution before. And now we do. And now we do. So, so now I can, we solve the problem that people were feeling on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're happy to pay us for it. Mm -hmm. And we get questions like, why are your prices so low? I got it. So Eunice, how many That's pants did we now. give away free? <laughs> <laughs> I'll take your free so how did you get? How did you, how, how did you get your first customer? Um, I mean, my very, cus very so first customers. She's in the clothing business. Is, is, uh, yeah. My very first customers were friends and family because I was testing my products. I didn't know that I could make the, the kind of thing that I wanted to make. Um, so really, I was forcing my friends and family to spend money. <laughs> um, but then uh, once we started getting real customers, um, uh, the way that I wanted to do my marketing was to do it through my customers because we didn't have like this marketing budget that so we So what did you do? You on. went to, you said, mom, give a good reference? <laughs> no, we just tried to make our, each order that we were shipping just incredibly, you know, whatever it was that we were doing, we just wanted to make it seem so special that they would just talk about it or get their friends to buy it. Um, because word of mouth marketing was the only thing that we could really rely on. Uh, we just didn't have a budget for anything else. So, you know, there was a theoretical unit price, but then there was our actual unit price because every order that we got, it was like handwritten notes and, you know, this ridiculously packaged thing that we were, you know, delivering to people. We try to make them feel special. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> so Rosie, how about you? Um, so we launched online, and my first customer was my sister, and then my mom. And I, we were um, in the beginning, used to literally look up the name of every person who came through our <laughs> website, and like, how do we know this person? And the best day of my life was when someone came through, and I had no idea who they were. I'm like, oh, we have a real business now. Um, I was like you uh, in the very beginning. I put a handwritten note in every single order that went out, and I actually asked people. I said, "We're a new company. If you like what what you're receiving, please spread the word. Please mm -hmm. post on Instagram. Oh, yeah. Please post we on Facebook. Please share it mm -hmm. with a friend." And people totally did it. I mean, I think there's something to. I think um, consumers today like to connect and feel like they're mm -hmm. part of something and mm -hmm. feel like they're part of a story, and people get excited about new young companies. So. Yes, that's a challenge, but use it as an opportunity. I think you have a great opportunity to get people to buy in and be fans just by simply saying, hey, I'm new here. Can you help me? Yeah. Good. So we have limited time, and 
what we wanted to do is leave, it, leave time for you to ask questions to the panel. There are two microphones, one mic two microphones. So if somebody has a question that you'd like to ask any one of us, or mainly them, um, don't be shy. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay, there's, there's a microphone right here. Yeah, no, well, this is a classy operation. <laughs> I want you to know I went to an event at Tesla uh, the uh, World, um, World Innovation Forum for Energy. I mean, really classy place. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? Uh, 2,000 people in the audience, and they asked for questions, and there were no mics. <laughs> it was ridiculous. So we are classy. Right? Um, we are UCLA. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I know you have, so we have entrepreneurs and a VC on stage. Can you talk about, from both sides, I'm just getting ready or preparing to go out for a seed round or to seed investors, and, and can you talk about, from both sides, what you presented and also what you, at least what you like to see? I can, so, oh, go ahead. Well, I just, we just closed around, so I'm very fresh on this. Um, Proof of concept is everything. If you can show that you have created something that people want and then you have a path forward and there's a wide open market, um, that's the core of it. If you have a great idea but you haven't shown that it's viable and you don't have customer, it's, it's a lot harder. So it, it can be anything. Let's say you have you know, a food concept, go sell it at the farmer's market and show how the demand was off the charts and, and then if you do that and you replicate it, how the business can grow. Um, I think also just, it sounds simple, silly, but having a, a really nicely done presentation that looks very polished and thought through, um, show your pitch deck to as many people as you can. Um, pitch as many people as you can before you actually go out and, and pitch the real people. Um, and talk to as many entrepreneurs who have done it as you can and, and find out from them what are the things that worked and didn't work. If you go into it blind, it, it's, it's not a good thing. <laughs> go into it <coughs> eyes wide open and having learned and talked to as many people as you can. So I had a request mm -hmm. for, because I didn't, you explained what your business was, but Eunice and Rosie did not. So what, what is your business? Oh, so Sugarfina is a luxury candy boutique. Um, we're candy for grown-ups. We have a more sophisticated positioning. Um, by the end of this year, we'll have 21 stores, uh, 13 shop and shops at Nordstrom. We have a website. We have a really robust wholesale business and a custom and corporate gifting business. So uh, I don't I don't sleep very much. Okay. <laughs> I'm very busy. Which is going to my last question, so you can start thinking about okay. it, all of you, yes. before we end. How do you balance your professional and personal lives? That's going to be the last question. But Eunice, what is your business? So um, I have a women's wear company called Ayla, and we make polished women's wear that feels as comfortable as yoga wear. So we sort of um, combine performance-oriented fabrics, uh, high-tech fabrics that feel a certain way with um, tailoring so that you can wear these clothes to your office, but also to low impact workout and everything in between. And we sell online and that's how we started, but now we're working with Bloomingdale's. Very good. Other questions from the audience? Okay, she's running to you fast. Hold your breath. We probably could hear you, but the rest of the people probably wouldn't, so. So I'm, I'm curious back to the, the, your first customer so you kind of alluded to, besides the friends and family, and maybe can you just describe your distribution channel? So is it like you got your kids, uh, friends, and then got the schools that they're at to do it, or did, is it online? And then if it was online, how did you get the, um, there's a billion things online, like if it was online, how did you get noticed, I guess? Face Facebook, Facebook ads are huge. Facebook ads drove much of our early business, um, you would be shocked by the power of a Facebook ad. It's incredible. Um, our marketing strategy has always been offline complemented by online. So we have a team of community managers who are out in the field, you know, moms like us who are out talking to their friends, their influencers, they're people who can say, well, I use it, you trust me, you know, you're like a mom friend to me. So if Oh, at Ivory, yes, we're at Ivory too. So, uh, so yeah, so that's for us. That's how we. It's really old school in many ways. Facebook. No one's going to put their kid in a car with someone they've never met because they saw a Facebook ad. They're just not. Right. Uh, but they may if they've 
seen a Facebook ad with an article in the New York Times or a CNN story, and then their friend told them about it, and then they put two and two together, and they say, oh, yeah, this is like a real thing. I can trust this. And also, you know, Maria used it, and I trust her. She's a good mom. I would say there's two really important things you have to do before you even think about marketing and how to get the word out is, do you have something that people want? Are you solving a problem that is not currently being solved? And who is your customer? Um, if you are doing those two things, um, it's actually pretty easy to get the word out, but if you're struggling with those two things, it's really difficult and you can spend a lot of money. Um, it, just like uh, you, know, you know your customer really well, you know what speaks to her and, and what motivates her. You know, same thing with us. For us, Instagram is our biggest channel because our product is very visual and people like to kind of play with it and take pictures of it. So dial in on who's going to be the person who's going to be most responsive, responsive to what your product is and then just think, like, where can I reach them and how can I reach them really cost effectively? <laughs> Learn a lot and, and then maybe look at spending a little money. Yeah. I mean, for us, um, every time we do anything, we always just go back to the question, where, how would our customers approach this or think about this or how would they find out about us? So it actually came down to a lot of traditional marketing. So PR is really, really huge for us. So that publication, that magazine that writes about us um, because people who want fashion advice want to you know, read these magazines and be informed. And then people, our customers who are more fashionable, read the magazines because that's something that they like to do and they enjoy and they like to find out about new things um, and feel like they are in the know. But how so, did you get that placement? It's, it's hard to get in a magazine. It's hard to get someone to interview. Did you hire and pay? A PR firm? In the very beginning, we hired a PR consultant, but I realized that it's kind of very expensive and yeah, so so not worth That's my why money. That's I'm asking. <laughs> so I, I just have an in-house marketing person now who dedicates our time to do in-house PR and we just know all the tricks. You know, we have, um, so a lot of the East Coast publications, they, so journalists like to open their emails like in the very early morning when they are commuting to work or they're not you know, already working on something. So you have to get that pitch into them at their time between like 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. And if you send them any emails after that, they just will never read it and they'll never get back to you. So you know, little tricks like that, we just like learned as we went. And we would just you know, do everything that we could as a small company to you know, optimize our chances of getting a story. Did that answer your question? <coughs> Any other questions? No, you're a male. You can't ask a question. Right. right here in front. No, no, he can ask a question. <laughs> Thank you for being here. So I'm not the only one. There's, a, there's so few of us. Well, I come from a, a background of working with small business owners, and I've seen graveyards filled with many a small business owner's right. ideas. So I guess my question for the, the ones who started companies would be, what is it, when you came upon challenges and when you came upon certain difficult times, what was it that made you keep focused and keep going whereas others might have just given up or any number of things? And maybe for those of you who advise business, um, businesses, what are those factors that kind of distinguish for you between those you know who are gonna go far and those who you are, have more questions or concerns about? I'll That's start. an easy question, next. <laughs> <laughs> I'll start. Uh, so I'm so sorry, Eunice, but you know, our my having co-founders, we just we sort of feed off each other's energy, and when one of us is feeling like we're ready to give up, you know, we have this acronym like WFIO. If you don't know what that means, look it up. It's we're f it's over. Like you think that on a regular basis when you're starting a company, you're like, this isn't going to work. Like I'm never, we're never going to be able to do this. And then you have someone else in the other corner saying like, don't you remember where we were six months ago? We're gonna do this. Like, remember the power of the beginning, you know, which is all that energy where you're just compelled to start the company. And we all go through peaks and valleys, and we just sort of carry each other through it. Um, right now, I think it's our customers. Like, people rely and depend on us, and every day are thanking us that we're saving marriages and we're saving jobs and we're saving, you know, like we're saving lives. I mean, we're not actually. We're just running kids around, but. It's very powerful, and so that's what keeps us going at this point. 
Maybe we'll go down the path here. So Sarah, what are you? Um, so, I mean, it's interesting. As someone who works with very, very young companies, I mean, I routinely get involved pre-seed. Um, I think that there, there is, and we talk about this a lot, actually, from a female perspective. We talk about grit, right? This is like a big thing. And there is um, a way to measure grit sociologically. And it's been my experience that people who have that, like, I will not take no for an answer. I'm throwing all of my eggs into this basket. Um, I mean, I, I work with women who have sold their homes to run their business. Um, they, you know, they've, they've invested a lot, lot, lot of their own personal finances. They are committed. And like, not just in the sense of like, oh, I quit my job and I've got two years of savings, so that's how long I'm committed. Like, they've, they've committed, committed. Um, and I think that because there is no option for failure, they just don't take no for an answer. Um, I think there are some other qualities that we, we probably hear a lot about, like you know, no, having domain expertise and, and things like that that matter. But um, from my perspective, because I do invest in the sense that I give away a ton of time for free, um, and I defer fees, and oftentimes, you know, those fees never get paid. Uh, it's unfortunate, but true. Um, for me, I always look for that because it is, you know, it's someone who will keep a promise to themselves about their business is going to keep a promise to me, and we'll be in it together. Um, for me, I think that every time I am sort of in that space, I think about yeah, how far I've come since having this idea. And you know, I always sort of try to take a step back and see where the business is headed. So you know, uh, a lot of things might be going wrong, but then the business has been, you know, generally on an upswing. So you know, I sort of, it's a combination of so many things. So it's like the, the grid and also, you know, the customers who I know are like, we, we have fans of the brand and I want to keep that going for their sake. And I think also, you know, I, I always just take a step back when, when I think that things are not going exactly the way that I had planned. And uh, having a supportive, like either friend or like partner counts for a lot of it because they'll sort of like ha be the wall that you can bounce off of. And for me, my, my partner is, you know, every time I'm like, oh my gosh, everything is going wrong, I don't know what to do, he'll be like, so then quit. And then I'd be like, wait a minute, I can't, I can't do that, what are you talking about? And then I'll start thinking about like, what, you know, why like, I need to think about something in a not emotional and more reasonable and rational way. So, yeah, I, I, I don't have a really good answer. I think that having an unfair advantage is often rewarded. So maybe not domain expertise, not that you know, like you know, car car sharing, but having the insight to what families and mom need, uh, you know, quite distinguishes you from the folks that have emerged as competition. And even in the you know the more uh, like highly technical spaces where you would think um, there'd be a less of an advantage to that it's still quite an advantage. So someone that for some reason has an extra sharp insight onto what they're pursuing, either because they understand the problem or the solution is, um, it, you know, is good to pay attention to. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think it's a great opportunity to always take a hard look at, is it really hard because I'm not working hard enough or is it really hard because I need to do something differently? Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's you know, whenever I come across a place where I'm just stuck and like, I hate this and I go outside and throw plates on the ground, you know, I take a second to be like, okay, wait, like why, why? Is this an opportunity to kind of tear everything and deconstruct everything and say, well, what if I just thought about this totally differently and it did in a different way? So I think sometimes when you do hit those roadblocks, it's not just about like keeping pushing on it and keeping trying harder and going, you know, harder and harder. It's maybe there's a roadblock for a reason. 
Um, and maybe it's an opportunity to, to, to do something really differently. So have you gone through a lot of plates? <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's so cathartic. It's great. <laughs> you got to know what's your outlet just for getting this. it out. <laughs> so I've been told one more question. Is there somebody who has a question or should we, do we want them to answer the, oh, we do have one. Okay. You get off the hook about the balanced life. <laughs> I don't have an answer for that. You're not going really to come back to that. <laughs> <laughs> so, did any of you have business ideas previously that just didn't take off, or did you start businesses previously that failed? Because I see entrepreneurship as ultimately a very creative process, and chances are you've had plenty of other inspirations. Is that to all of them, or <laughs> one, someone in particular? I had a lot of ideas that I didn't pursue that I later regretted. Uh, because somebody else did them, mm -hmm. and um, I suffered, and I still do, although less so from a very severe form of imposter syndrome, which <laughs> if you're familiar with, um, is this idea of women who feel like they're gonna get found out, that they don't actually know what they're doing, mm -hmm. um, and for many years suffered from that, and so I would have these ideas that would be like, oh no, it must be a bad idea because no one's doing it, and then someone does it and is hugely successful, and you realize, oh, that totally should have been me, um, that was Facebook, but go no, ahead. No, that was American. No, that was, for the record, it was American Apparel. But anyway, so, uh, so you know, I, I think that um, it's really getting over that hump. And any idea that you have that you believe in pursuing, knowing that failure is actually, um, n number one, a huge learning opportunity, and number two, a, a very uh, good chance of that happening, and just accepting that and being ready to move on. Actually, that's I've learned more from the companies that, um, did not do well or failed uh, than the ones that have been successful. It's, e I don't want to say it's easier, but when you have the resources, it allows you more leeway. When your back is to the wall and things are not going well, you really find out what you're made of and what the people you deal with are made of. And you actually find out what your investors are made of. Hmm. Uh, so well, w you know, one of the things that I'd like to say is if, you know, um, you should, when you're interviewing investors, because you should interview them also, if you're not, you know, it's a good idea, ask them to speak to somebody, to the founding member of a team that went out of business, that failed. And that person will tell, and if they say they never invested in a failed business, I don't believe it. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe <laughs> did you ever have one that, did, that, did one fail it, out of, of all course, of them? Of course, yeah. Okay, so good. So <laughs> just, I, I think it's a good thing. Somebody did that to me when they asked me for a reference, they said, don't get, I don't want the reference that are gonna be good. Tell me somebody who really dislikes you. <laughs> you know, somebody that didn't wanna do business with you. And, you know, and I did, and I still got hired. <laughs> it was great. Um, but I learned from that experience. So I was told that my time is up. I think, I think you should address the balance question. Oh, the balance question. Let me explain. I, I'm, not, I, uh, I'm not one of the women here on the panel. Uh, I was fortunate in my career, a crazy workaholic, lots of different uh, luck and timing. I uh, worked at a company that went from zero to seven billion in six years and uh, got a divorce after 26 years of marriage because I didn't have a balanced life. Seven million frequent flyer miles. Uh, my family loved all the success and all the money, but I totally was out of control. Uh, and I enjoyed what I did. Uh, and I think if I had to do things over, I would try to have more balance in my life. I'm closer to my children today, who are 43 and 40, to give you an idea of age. I'm closer to my children and my four grandchildren than I was to my children when they were growing up. Something's wrong with that picture, okay? That is not a good thing. So I try to teach the students to try to have a balanced life. It's hard. I mean, I bet you, I'm not going to say you don't have a balanced life, but I bet you, well, I'm not going to bet. Do you I have mean, a balanced I, life? I don't have a balanced life by any means. I mean. So let me, I know a good divorce attorney. Right. No, no God forbid. I mean, the first, first thing is that, like, I, I just, I'm going to turn it around because I feel like yeah. we're old friends for some reason. But, like, I just wonder, like, no one ever asks men about right. how they balance work and family. They don't ever. ask. They never ask. This is a question, offense to you, on every panel that I've sat on. Mm -hmm. And the question is, like, why is the expectation that women have But I answered family? it. No, I understand. You yeah. answered very well. So I'm going to just say this. So I, I married, I met my husband here in law school. And um, 
We both worked for law firms, Terrific. and three years later, I we had our first child, and his career went like this, and my career went like this, and then we had our second child, and his career went like this, and I had our third child, and like he's a partner now, you know. They have 18, fourteen children. Have three kids, you know. He's eighteen years a partner at a the one of the biggest law firms in the world, and I ended my law career um, as a solo practitioner. So. You know, I held my end of the bargain for many, many years. I was the default parent. And the last two years, it's not me anymore. And so, yeah, like he was at the doctor this morning at 9.30 and I was on a conference call. And that's okay. Like, I don't have a balanced life right now. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, for short stints of time, like numbers of years, as long as there's yeah. one solid family member or caregiver who is a constant present in those children's lives, because it really is most like of the time the about kids, yep. uh, you know, I actually think it's okay. And my daughter got a trophy on Sunday because the soccer coach of the six-year-old said she was the toughest player on his team. She's the only girl. So I'm going to take some credit, you know, for that because she sees what I'm going through. Um. <laughs> Let's not yes. all fly, but that was good. Okay, Sarah, you, you I, explain. I want to just talk about one thing related to balance, and that's sleep. <laughs> um, because I feel like it's a dirty word, and I feel like most people regard it as a as as the very it's the very first thing to go. And I am very proud to say I sleep eight hours a night, every night, and I'm an attorney, <laughs> and probably, and I'm. You know, and honestly, it makes me a better worker. When when I am at work, I am focused. I am I am listening. Um, I work much more efficiently. But I think so many of us are. Um, we don't do ourselves the favor of protecting our sleep time, and um, so I wouldn't necessarily say that I have a perfectly balanced life by any means. But that is the one thing that I guard. Come hell or high water, I go to bed at 11. There are no electronics in my bedroom. I am asleep until 7 a.m. And like, God help the person who messes with sleep. So that would be my one encouragement to think about doing because it will add years to your life. I totally agree with you. I have no personal life at all. But the one thing that I do is I have like, I have like this sleep quota throughout the month. So if I'm getting, you know, very little sleep for like two weeks, then I try to catch up over the weekend because I am very inefficient if I'm tired. If you're tired all the time, you can't think straight and be creative. I learned that after, you know, like a stint of like several months of just not sleeping at all. And then I just became this terrible, like, you know, <laughs> sluggish, inefficient person. Um, and then also right now, I mean, it seems like you sort of touched on this, but I think that it's really important to have a partner who can sort of understand the different phases that you're going through in your life. So me and my fiance, we were just in a work mode. So when we're home, we just work. Uh, over the weekend, we work together at home, but we're working and that's okay. Um, and you know, it, whatever happens in the next year in the you know in, in our life we just have this understanding that there will always be imbalance but we'll just have to sort of be have it be a partnership and sort of bear the weight together it won't ever be equal though mm -hmm. so i also i work all the time i also have a fiance that's really supportive who i don't think i could probably have done most you know anything that i've done without, but that's quite a privilege, and of course you can't manufacture that. Um, to bring it back to what was the first comment said, I'll say that I was lucky to be at a dinner um, with some founders from the PhD engineering school, a PhD at MIT, a few weeks ago where it was, it was all male founders, um, but the two people hosting the dinner it was a woman in VC, friend of mine and myself, and it was Great to see. I was surprised at the end of the night because one of the guys that was a new dad said, you know, what I want to ask you guys is this, like, I'm only seeing my child or holding my child like 20 minutes a day. Um, and how have you guys dealt with this when you've gone through it? And so I think perhaps it was nice for me to see that because guys don't get asked that on panels or ever. And it's probably a good thing. Um, you know, for that to happen with men and women founders. And certainly I think that guys, these were younger guys, so, you know, like, you know, mid-30s, something like this. Um, 
And you know, I think that whatever balance means for each person is what it means. I think it mostly means checking in to make that make sure that you're doing okay. And if that means like ordering more sugar fina that month or <laughs> talking <laughs> to your partner or going to sleep, like all of those things, it can mean something different for everyone. But you know, men and women are good to check in with and make sure your friends are mm -hmm. finding that. Mm -hmm. um, I'm no different than anyone up here and any entrepreneur I've ever talked to. Um, it, it's always a struggle for balance. I actually want to talk about something a little different. Um, when you are growing a company and bringing on a team, giving the impression that you have balance in your life is really important because if people see you as a slave driver and someone who has no life and you know maybe you're a little bit miserable and that comes into work, they're not going to be happy. Nobody wants that in their leaders. Um, so you need to set an example that you care about balance, that you want the people on your team to be balanced. And you need to occasionally set that example so that they feel the permission to do that in so themselves. Um, you want a happy culture. You're going to attract way better people to work at your company if you do that. I know we ran over. Don't yell. <laughs> Thank you so much. That was a tremendous treat for all of us. I don't know if this is on. Is this on? Yeah. Yes? Okay. Thank you so much. I was hoping you would go over because I was concerned about the short amount of time that we had really allocated for all of you to speak. And uh, it was interesting to me that we had uh, women who are running really women focused businesses to retail and in a sense, I mean yours is a technology company, but it's it's you know, public serving, public facing. It is like a retail thing and I think it makes for a very cohesive conversation. So thank you all uh, for coming. Before I thank each of you individually, I really want to thank Melissa uh, and her team. She's been amazing. They are amazing and I think she might be other than <laughs> She, she and Betty run really first-rate events um, from soup to nuts. I, I think you were probably up here walking, making sure that the directions were right. Somebody had signs out for all of us, uh, the timeline this evening, all of it. And that it, there's so much behind the scenes that these ladies put into it. So thank you very much. And I know, I'll start with Rosie, because she and I, I was learning some negotiating skills <laughs> as we were setting this up because she was good enough to leave early from a long board meeting, I think an important <laughs> board meeting, this afternoon and I was, she was like, well, how early do I have to be there? Well, how far is the walk from parking? And I was like, well, maybe I could come pick you up <laughs> from the board meeting so that we could put it together. So thank you so much for making it work, all of you entrepreneurs, because this kind of time is so valuable in their day when they're working you know, when they're not sleeping, we know they're working. Um, and to the, the support team, you know, that makes it happen. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, there's, there's nothing like it. And, and one of the things we just barely touched on that I could really see um, for perhaps a follow-on conversation like this would be about equity. Because mm. I, I didn't ask the question because that's a very complicated and nuanced question, but I'm sure if people are looking at investors in their business, um, looking at co-founders, that's a really, really big conversation. And it's non-obvious. There are more different structures than you can imagine. And talking with people who have been there, really valuable. So perhaps another day we'll do that. Um, so, Carolyn, Sarah, Eunice, Elise, Rosie, and Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your time with us tonight. Thank you. And we have um, a drawing. Oh, this is really valuable, this guys. Is a high value item. Profession Professor Shinerock is an author, which I didn't know. <laughs> and and if you aren't the one who wins the book, I have two of them. I'll I'll tell you. Um, well, I think I already told you the main gist, which is who's going to pay for it, mm -hmm. right? No, not not the book. 
The customer, you have to have customers. <laughs> you have to have advice. customers. <laughs> you have to have customers. Isn't this about a startup? The yeah, book is. 200 le this is 162 lessons of 200 words or less of what I've done in my career, what I've learned. And what's really interesting is that each page is uh, awesome. characterized <laughs> by a cartoon character. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this is published by Wiley. And I have to tell you, networking, critical. There's a VC uh, named Brad Fell, mm -hmm. uh, who's a foundry and Boulder, and he's the, one of the co-founders of Techstars. I invested in his fund when he left uh, SoftBank Capital and, uh, to, and Mobius to start uh, Foundry. And he was a successful author with Wiley. It was really hard to get a book published. So what I did is I called him and I said, would you mind sending in the, <laughs> the, the, uh, my, the script or the transcript to Wiley? And they picked me up in like 24 hours. And I, it has nothing to do with the book. I mean, you can tell it's really, <laughs> really, really academic. Um, but it's very practical. So we have so this one's three bucks to get you Starbucks. Two people <laughs> who will take books home tonight, okay. and maybe you'll draw the two names. Okay. Jack Shiner. <laughs> Kathy Sohrabi. So will you be autographing these? <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I hope you guys will stick around and visit for a little bit longer because we're very excited about bringing together such a mix of women. This is rare at UCLA, and we're doing more and more of it. So I hope you'll take this opportunity. I don't know how long our panelists can stay, but we'd love to have you stay for a few minutes and share more words of wisdom. Thank you so much.